Thank you for joining us for this week's message at Crosswind Church. If you have any questions about this message or about Crosswind Church, please visit us at www.crosswindchurch.net or you can email us at info at crosswindchurch.net. Love that. Uh, my name is Jeremy and I'm the pastor here and uh, we are right in week two of this series, Hooked Up, The New Rules for Love, Sex, and Dating, and I'm, I'm so thankful that you've joined us uh, for this week, because today we get to talk about sex, right? How cool is that? And uh, for those of you that haven't been in the dating game uh, for a while, like, if I'm, I'm just going to say, even if you've been in the dating game, but you're older, like, if you're probably 30 and older, maybe 35 and older, uh, I need to update you on a few things before we move forward, okay? And these things are really super important for us to kind of understand as we move into, uh, into this series. First and foremost, I want you to understand that the internet has changed the way we date. The internet, internet has changed everything, okay? And so, so one of the ways that the internet has changed everything is by the introduction of pornography. You guys may not know this, but the average age of exposure to pornography is six years old. Now, what's interesting is that it used to be when you were a kid, you know, a long time ago, back in the ancient days, uh, like me, um, if, if you wanted to find pornography or pictures of naked women or even just, like, scantily clad women, um, you had to, like, go to a seedy part of town to, like, some kind of crazy gas station or go to, like, a bookstore and buy a magazine and risk being seen by somebody else. Or you had to have, like, like your dad had to have, you know, like, like a magazine, you know, that was, like, in a box in his closet or under the bed or wherever it was. You had to have a friend whose dad had like a stash of magazines. Like that was the only way that, that it, it could occur. But now um, you're seeing uh, the internet has just absolutely changed the way that this is distributed to our homes. I told you the average age is six. What you may not know, if you have a 13 to 14 year old boy, one out of every three 13 to 14 year old boys are classified as heavy pornography users. That means that they stream 50 or more videos a week. 33%, right? Wow, that's incredible. All right. It's changed the way that we view women. It's changed the way that we view men. In fact, uh, what pornography teaches us without even kind of knowing it is, is pornography teaches us that, um, that a real body is not enough, that one body is not enough, and one day it will actually teach you that your wife's body is not enough. We'll talk about that in just a little bit, okay? But, but this has absolutely changed everything. Pornography industry is so large, porn sites actually garner more visitors than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined in 2015, right? It is big, big, big business. The second way that the internet has changed the way that we date is, is changed the way we hook up with people or we notice people or come to meet people. It used to be that Facebook was one of those things, like you remember when Facebook was like popular back, you know, like, I don't know, 10 years ago. Things changed so quickly now. Um, and you would reconnect with old flames and reconnect with old boyfriends, old girlfriends, that sort of thing. Now we have apps that you can download to your uh, phone, like Tinder or like uh, OkCupid. Uh, there's a, there's a handful of others that allow you to connect with hundreds of people that you don't even know that are in close vicinity of you. Some of them even allow you to, to like see where other people on the app are so that you can go and find them. That's frightening right there, right? And, and, and you can actually, I told you last week that, that I've read articles about guys that are, that are swiping right, swiping left on 300 pictures of women or, or, or girls that are swiping on 300 pictures of men and, and hooking up with three to five of them for dates every week, sleeping with all of them and putting them on pace to have sex with somewhere between 50 and 100 partners a year, different people. And we joke about what's your name again, love, but that's really, that's really kind of, kind of what, what that amounts to, doesn't it? it? It's changed the way that we interact with people. It's changed the way that we view our sexuality. It changed the way that we date. Things have, have changed dramatically. And because of that, because of the pornification of America, because of the sexualization of the world in which we live in, it causes us to buy into a handful of lies. And these lies are really important. Now, before I get into lies, I just need to tell you, this is the burden that I'm carrying today. I can't make you believe that these are lies. I can tell you they're lies. I can explain why they're lies. But I can't make it penetrate your heart. I've tried my best to, to make myself think like a 16-year-old boy today. And, and, and I, I, just, I want the, the truth just to penetrate our because it can change our lives. The first lie that we buy into because of what society has kind of done, because of kind of the way the world of dating and sex is now, is we bought into the idea that sex is casual. This means that like sex is the same thing as like getting up and going and grabbing a burger, or walking the dog, or going to the gym. Right? It's no big deal. Everybody does it, and, and, and you don't want to miss out. It's just kind of this casual kind of thing. The second thing that, that we buy to is this lie that sex is essential. 
I have to have it. That's kind of what the world tells us. You've got to have it or you will explode or something terrible will happen. I always kind of raise my eyebrow when I hear somebody go, listen, man, i got needs. It's not just guys that say it, right? But i got, I got needs, man. I don't know what you know. But you don't have to be a redneck to believe it. Listen, I heard it. <laughs> right. Food is a need. It, like, water is a need. Like in Northwest Tennessee, at certain times of the year, shelter is a need, right? <laughs> Sex is not a need. You don't have to believe me. You can do the research for yourself. I, I, I bet there are people we can find them. People that have gone their entire life and never once had sex, and they didn't die because of it, and they didn't even get sick, right? It's not essential. It's not a need. Okay. The second, the last line we kind of bite you. This is the biggie: is that sex is just physical. Sex is just physical, meaning that it's just a physical act. It's like working out. It's just something that we engage in. In fact, you might hear this. We're just animals, right? We're just animals, and animals have sex. It's just something that they kind of do. In fact, in fact, you, you may remember that Nine Inch Nails did a very famous song called Closer back in the 90s that said, I want to do this to you like an animal, right? You may remember the other song that said, you and me, baby, we ain't nothing but mammals, so let's do it like we do on the Discovery Channel, right? We're just, we're just animals, like you've heard this. This is what... This is what society is kind of teaching us. Here's the thing. This, is, this always blows me away. This always blows me away. Stick with me. You see, we like to say that we're just animals and it's just physical, but then, this is so pertinent for today, then when a man acts like an animal, we're appalled. All right. If, if, if we're just animals, then, then what Weinstein did, that's no big deal. We're just animals. He's just acting in his instincts. See, we don't really believe that. It's an absolute lie that we believe. Now, here's the thing. The church, I don't think, has done a very good job. Maybe even as parents, we haven't done a very good job of helping explain to our kids that these things are a lie. And so as we move forward, just as a church, I want to talk about some amazing truths about God's Word when it comes to sex. Truth from God's Word about, about sex. So, so here's some things just real quick that kind of combat those lies that the world tells us. The first thing is this. You may not be aware of this. This is really good news for some of you. Sex is God's idea. It was God's idea. If we didn't come up with it, he came up with it. Levi Lusco, in that book I just gave you, he described it this way. He said, the first gift that God gave man was a nap. The second gift that God gave man was sex. He gave it to us. In Genesis chapter 2, it says that man and woman would come together, they were naked, and they were unashamed, and God looked at him and went, be fruitful and multiply. Have some fun, Right? Well, the second thing that kind of plays along with that is not only sex God's idea, but, but God wants you to have amazing sex. Now, some people kind of push back on this. Well, sex is just, you know, for reproduction. And God really doesn't want us to have amazing sex. Let me tell you why I believe wholeheartedly that God wants us to have amazing sex. He made it feel amazing. He could have done it either way. He could have made it like eating food. He could have done it like, like, like going to the bathroom. He could have made it just any kind of other physical act right, that we all experience every day. He didn't make it like that, though. He made it feel amazing. And so it's not like, so like, like God is embarrassed when, when we figure out how to have fun having sex. No, he's like, listen, I want you to, 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 to have amazing sex. But here's the thing. God has given us instructions on how sex is to be used. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, he says, Therefore a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. We'll read about that in just a minute. What he's saying is this, is that marriage has been given some boundaries that one man, one woman, in marriage is the boundaries in which sex is supposed to take place. So I'm like, why, why, why? If God wants us to have amazing sex, and God, sex is God's idea, why does he give us these, these boundaries that are put in? It's because sex is incredibly powerful. We'll figure this out in just a minute. We'll read some more verses. Sex is incredibly powerful, but it is incredibly dangerous when it's taken out of the appropriate context. The best way to illustrate it is this. If you were to go camping and you were to build a fire inside of a fire pit, that fire can cook your food, it can keep you warm, it can light up your campground, and it can even, in some cases, save your life. But if that fire gets outside of that fire pit, it can burn the entire woods 
down. And what God understands and what I want you to understand today with all of my heart, I want you to understand, is that sex is an amazing thing. It's a gift to us by God, but it's given to us inside of these boundaries because when it gets outside of these boundaries, if we're just honest with ourselves, it hurts you and it hurts the people that are around you. It hurts you and it hurts the people that are around you. Sometimes we think that God just wants to keep us from having fun, and that's why he's given us these boundaries. This is such an absurd argument. Let me tell you why. Guys, if you were to go to Lowe's right after church today, and you were to buy a chainsaw, and you were to take that chainsaw home, that chainsaw is incredibly powerful, right? But the second you pull that bad boy out of the box, guess what's going to come with it? Instruction manuals, warning labels, Things that tell you where safety goggles and leather chaps. I don't know. I don't own a chainsaw. I don't know what all of them are. Like, don't cut down a limb when it's over your house. These are the types of things it's going to say, right? Come on. And not once does a guy, and I know he might disregard the rules, but not once does a guy go, oh, man, Husqvarna, they're just wanting to ruin my food. No! It's because they know that if you take this powerful tool and use it in the wrong way, it can cut your leg off. It can, it can drop a limb on your house. Listen, that, it's an absurd argument to think that God's just trying to keep us from having fun. No, 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 watch. God just knows that this powerful thing has to be kept inside these confines of one man, one woman for life. And I still didn't answer the question, why? I think sometimes as parents, maybe we fall short. You know, we have that sex talk with our kids. Or one day if you do have kids coming in, you're going to have sex talk with them or whatever. Hopefully you do. Hopefully you don't just... Leave it up for grabs, right? And they go, but why does sex need to be kept in marriage? And our response for years has just been, because the Bible says so, just move on. But you want to know something? The Bible actually addresses this topic. The Bible actually tells us why sex needs to be kept in these confines. And so today what I want to do is I want to just take a minute and I want to look into the Word of God and I want to see what it has to say about why sex needs to be kept within the boundaries of marriage. And see if we can't develop some steps that we can take so that we can be more responsible with this incredibly powerful tool that we've been given. Now, here's the pushback I'm going to get immediately. Here you go. But Jeremy, but Jeremy, Jeremy, Jeremy. Listen, that was written in the first century. This is the 21st century. Things are different. You told us the internet has changed the game. We, we, we're exposed to things more early. We're exposed to things more often. Um, uh, th there are ads that are running. And we've got Victoria's Secret catalogs and SI swimsuit issues. And, and we've got all this stuff coming to our house. We are bombarded with this message. We can't watch TV. We can't watch movies. We can't do any of that without this message that sex is casual. Sex is just physical. It, it just kind of, kind of being pounded into our brains. Listen, what Paul had to say in the first century was probably pretty good. But, but it, there's no way that it can apply to us. It's just going to be too radical. It's going to be too out there. If, if that's the pushback you have, I'm so glad you decided to come today. Here's why. Because the context in which Paul has written was a lot like the context of today. Paul was writing to a city called Corinth. And as, as far as a sexualized city, Corinth was, was on the top of the list. They had temples there in Corinth that were part of their cultic worship where prostitution was actually an act of worship. You could go to the temple and get a prostitute and have sex with the prostitute and that be an act of worship, right? That, that was just a part of the culture. In fact, prostitution was so rampant in Corinth and throughout the rest of the Roman Empire at this point in time that, that, that the, the high up official Caesar and, and, and the like in Rome were so concerned because the, the elite of the men, the aristocracy, like those people that had wealth and influence and power, they weren't even getting married anymore. Because they were like, listen, I, uh, I don't want to have to deal with this wife thing. I don't want to have a woman that's in my house all the time. I just want to have sex. And so I can go get a prostitute and do whatever it is that I want to do with this prostitute and then not have to deal with the wife. Sign me up. That's what's going on in Rome, right? So much so that the Romans were concerned that none of their elite were getting married. So actually trying to pass laws. So that they would have to get married. That's the context in which Paul is writing. So if you think it's radical for us, it was incredibly radical for them, right? That Paul wrote this. In his first letter to the church in Corinth, in chapter 6, he wrote these words. Look at verse 15 of chapter 6. He said this, Do you not know, which implies that they didn't, do you not know that 
Your bodies are members of Christ himself, to which everyone would go, yeah, we get that. When we become a follower of Christ, we become a part of the body of Christ. Uh, my body is no longer my own. It belongs to Christ. They, they would have understood that. I get that. I know that. <coughs> shall then, he said, shall I take a member of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. To which the people that he was writing this to went, unite. No one's uniting. Where does that have sex? Right? This unite thing that you're talking about, no one's wanting like joining or one. No, this is merely sexual. Paul, I don't know what in the world you're talking about, uh, about uniting. No one is uniting. In fact, I was uniting with the prostitute right before I came here to hear this, this, this letter read. Like, like, this is so, so radical. Paul, surely that's not what you mean. He goes on in verse 16 and says this, Do you not know, which again implies they do not, that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body, for it is said the two will become one flesh. Whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. So, so here's what Paul is going to appeal to now. He's going to go back to the Old Testament, to that verse that we read earlier. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. A man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And he says, listen, it's more than just sex. It's more than just a physical thing. When you sleep with a woman, when you sleep with a man, you are joining with him. You are becoming one with him in the way that God intended husbands and wives to become one. The term that's used there refers to a welding together of two objects that weren't meant to be separated again after that. Some have defined it in this way as a mingling together of souls. But let me explain it this way. For the service, I glued these two pieces of paper together. This is to symbolize the welding together of two individuals when they have sex with one another. This is the becoming one. And, and, and you know, I just used regular old Elmer's glue. It's not super glue. It's not anything like that. But, but this it, it is an imperfect illustration of what it is that Paul is trying to say. When we couple up with other people and we become one with them and then we uncouple from them, we are never, ever, ever the same again. There's a piece of us that goes with them and there's a piece of them that comes with us. You understand that, that, that you're melded together, welded together and when you rip apart what it is that you've joined together, it makes more difficult problems for you and causes hurt that is so deep inside you. And listen, those of you that experience this, you understand this. If you're just honest with yourself, you know that it's not just physical. You know that it's more than that. You know that it's this intermingling of souls that takes place. You want to know something that happens? When you have sex with someone, there are hormones and chemicals that are released in your brain. One of which is the same chemical that's released uh, in some of the drugs that we use that cause an addiction, right? So you have to have more and more and more. In fact, this is what causes pornography addiction. So many guys and, and women now, to be honest with you, but, but, but it's this chemical that's released. In, in fact, those of you that have been married and you've been divorced or you've been in sexual relationships that have ended, you actually can go through withdrawal in the same way that you go through withdrawal when you've been addicted or you've been taking, uh, like, say, prescription pain pills illegally. You, you, with me? You, you go through that withdrawal. That's why you notice it when you've been married for X number of years and, and this chemical has become it come in your brain over and over and over and over and over again and then there's that separation and you feel terrible physically. There's actually a chemical reason that that's taking place. There's also another hormone that's released in your body. It's the same hormone that women have released in their bodies and babies have released in their body when, when a mother breastfeeds her child. It's a chemical that causes a bonding between the mother and the child. And when you sleep with someone, that same chemical is released in your brain. Listen, you know how I know this? It's because relationships that you've been involved in that were sexual and terrible, you stayed in them. Because you knew, you felt something. There's a connection there. Listen, this is a chemical reaction that takes place inside of your brain. It's not just physical, y'all. It's a melding together of your souls, a welding together of the two of you that you, in fact, are becoming one flesh. So here's Paul's application. Verse 18, flee from sexual immorality. Let's, let's stop here real quick. This is really important. He uses the word flee. He doesn't say work through sexual immorality. He didn't say wean yourself off of sexual immorality. He didn't say deal with sexual immorality. He says flee from it, run from it, get away from it. 
When I was um, uh, in, in about five to eight, from five to eight, I took karate. You may be surprised to hear that. <laughs> and I was also, I was never a big guy. But I got pretty confident in my karate skills, right? Not enough to call it karate, just karate, right? All right, I got pretty confident in my karate skills. And, and I remember saying something to my mom at one point in time, like, I don't ever want to fight him. I was eight years old, probably weighed 45 pounds, right? Like, I was like, I, I don't want to get in a fight with anybody because I might actually really hurt him. I remember saying that. This must have gotten back. I'm assuming this got back to my cry teacher because in the weeks that followed my cry teacher, his name was Wayne. He's from Vietnam. He sat down with me one on one and he said, Jeremy, I, I wish I could do Wayne's accent. I love Wayne. He would go, Jeremy, he, he went, um, if you ever get into a fight with someone, I want you to stomp on their foot, kick them, and then run and hide. <laughs> because here's what Wayne knew, right? I can be the best at karate, at 8 years old, and 45 pounds, but if some dude grabs a hold of me, it's game over. You with me? This is why Paul says flee from sexual immorality, not just trying to deal with it. He's saying stomp it in the foot, kick it in the shin, and run and hide, because if sexual immorality, watch, if it gets a hold of you, it's not letting go. This is a big deal. Run away from it. And here, sexual morality is sex outside of the fire pit. It's sex outside of one man and one woman for life. Outside of marriage. That's what he's talking about here. So this means he's talking about sexual morality. He's saying flee from sexual intercourse. Flee from oral sex. Flee from pornography. Flee from those things that give you sexual feelings outside of marriage about someone other than your spouse. Flee from it. Run from it. Get away from it. And here's the reason why. All other sins... All other sins, he said, a person commits outside of his body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. This is, this is a big deal. Paul says, listen, I need you to understand something about sexual sin. It falls in a category all by itself. It, it gets its own category. And it doesn't get its own category because God hates it. God, God created it. It was his idea. <laughs> It doesn't fall into its own category because when you commit sexual sin, you get your special place in hell, right? No, that's not why it gets its own category. Sexual sin gets its own category because it causes pain that is so deep, so much deeper than other forms of sin. It's different. It falls in its own category. You know what's interesting? Sometimes when we talk about sin getting in some category, people kind of push back a little bit. But, but can we be honest with each other? I'm just going to be honest. Okay? You're just going to be honest with yourselves and send me emails later. Listen, if we were to think about it, we know that sex is different than everything else, don't we? But if we, if we were real honest with our own hearts and our own minds, we, we would know that. Now, my wife is real nervous about what I'm getting ready to say next. I want you to know I have no agenda, and I'm in no way trying to minimize anything. But, but just, just talk through this with me. We know sex is different, don't we? If it wasn't different, then why is it when a child is sexually molested, we treat that differently, and the pain that carries with them throughout the rest of their life is different than a child that is simply abused? Now, I'm not in any way minimizing child abuse. I'm in no way minimizing that child that is beaten. I'm not trying to say that isn't terrible, but I'm saying let's be honest with ourselves. It, when, when there's a child that's sexually molested, which by the way, one out of four girls, one out of six boys by the time they're 18. That's different. And we can talk to CPS workers and we can read the data. They carry that with them. Oftentimes they're sexually reacted later in life. Oftentimes they act out sexually later in life. And they do so because what happened to them was not just getting beat up which is bad enough. It's something that's deeper than that. If sex isn't different, then why is it that, that a woman who is raped, we handle that situation differently than a woman that is physically abused? And in no way am I trying to minimize physical abuse. It is absolutely terrible. It's one of the things that makes me want to just fight you about. In no way am I minimizing that. But come on, we treat women psychologically different when they're raped because it's different. And why is it, if sex is no different than every other sin, why is it when people come and sit in my office and they begin a phrase like this, my worst regret is, or I've never told anyone this, the phrase that comes to effort is always sexual in nature. Always. It's, it's I hooked up with this girl, I did something with this guy, 
I cheated on my wife, I cheated on my spouse, I'm hooked on porn, whatever it may be. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, watch, watch, watch. We know this. Sex is just different. And Paul catches on to this 2,000 years ago and goes, listen, all other sins are outside of your body. This particular sin is one that you commit against your own body. It's its own category of sin. If you still don't believe me, do this, do this. Go find someone that's a little bit older that was engaged sexually before they got married and ask them, when you introduce sex into your relationship or when you introduce sex into your life, did it make things easier or did it make things more complicated? I feel so confident in you going and asking did anyone that because here's what sex does. It always complicates things. It always confuses things. It causes things to happen in your brain that aren't really there. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, we know this to be true. You know this if you're just honest with yourself. But we keep, we keep hooking up. We keep decoupling. We keep coupling and unhooking and, and, and doing this over and over and over and over and over and over again. Do you want to know what happens? You can go read the books and the data for yourself. What happens eventually is you become numb. You don't feel anymore. If you're a guy, your wife just won't do it for you. If you're a woman, you've, you've hooked up with so many guys that, that now there is no feeling. There is no connection. You're just numb. You've ingested so many books so much pornography and so many images and so many videos that like we said earlier, a real body isn't enough, one body isn't enough, and your wife or your husband's body sure is not enough. When asked about the hookup culture, do you want to know what people said? Millennials, you know what they said? 41% of people said that hooking up makes me feel sad, mad, lonely, confused, angry, frustrated, and before you kind of go 41%, well, that means 59%, must have thought it was fine. Yeah, 50, of the 59 remaining percent, the best that any of them could muster was that hooking up made me feel okay about myself. Zero percent said I feel better about myself. Hooking up. Zero percent. Do you know why they did that? It's because they know. They won't admit it to themselves. Maybe you won't admit it to yourself. But it's different. It's different than every other sin. We know that. You know that. But, 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 but Jeremy, 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 listen, man, like, you wouldn't buy a car without test driving it first. Jeremy, Jeremy, you wouldn't buy a pair of shoes without trying them on first. Like, we got we to gotta sleep together to see if we're sexually compatible with one another. Let, let, me, let, me, let me fill you in. If you're a boy, she's a girl, you're sexually compatible. <laughs> All the parts work, I promise. Like, everything... Everything happens the way it's supposed to happen. Here's what you're really concerned about. Be honest. Here's what you're really concerned about. You're not concerned about compatibility. You're concerned about technique. Let's be honest. Right? And here's why, here's why this is so funny. Here's why this is so funny. It's because you, you know this. If you hooked up and unhooked up and coupled and uncoupled, you know that what satisfies girls A, but girl A may not satisfy girl B. And what satisfies boys A, what may not satisfy boy B. And so you're like, well, I guess practice just makes perfect. I just got to have sex with as many people as I possibly can. Let me tell you, you have it right when you say practice makes perfect. Practice makes perfect with your wife. Practice makes perfect with your husband. If you're worried about compatibility, if you're worried about technique, Marry someone with integrity, ask them what they want, and then practice with them. Because when you do it the other way, it leads to hurt, and it leads to regret, and it leads to shame, and it leads to all sorts of pain deep down inside of you that you can't fix on your own. Listen, you can protect yourself from sexually transmitted disease. You can protect yourself from, from pregnancy, but they do not make a condom that fits over your soul. All other sins, he says, fall in this kind of sexual sin is different. It causes pain that is deep, deep, deep down. Then he talks to Christians. For those of you who are here today and you're not a believer, you can disregard this. If you're a Christian, this is, this is, this is for you. This is what he says. Verse 17, oh, excuse me, Verse, uh, verse 19. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, Christians, honor God with your 
bodies here. All this talk we did in brand new about, about you know, your, your body being a temple of the Lord and the Holy Spirit's in there. There's no sacred place, but you now are a sacred place, a portable tabernacle, a portable temple. Every time you unite, hook up, link arms with, do whatever it is with someone else, you're dragging the Holy Spirit and the body of Christ into a situation that it didn't need to be in. And after all, you know this, it's not your body, Christians. So honor God with your body. So how do we do that? What does that, what does that even look like? First of all, I think we have to recognize that when Paul tells us to flee from sexual immorality, it means that we're going to have to take some radical, drastic measures. First thing, I want to point out, falls under this big, broad category of, of I want you to have stronger external barriers. I want you to have stronger external barriers. Listen, there are, there are dopamine chains going on in your brain that are causing you to do things that you don't want to do. I get it. So you've got to set up some boundaries to keep you from that. That means that if you're using an app like Tinder or OkCupid to hook up and have sex with people, you need to get rid of the app. And if you can't control yourself from putting it back on your phone, you need to delete your account. And if you can't stop yourself from creating new accounts, then you need to block your app store and give a password to somebody that you trust. But that sounds so radical. Yes! He told us not to deal with it. He didn't tell us to kind of manage it. He didn't tell us to wean ourselves off. He said, flee from it. Run from it for some of you all. <laughs> for some of you all, that means you have to get rid of your smartphone and go to Walmart today and buy a $20 flip phone. But people laugh at me. They'll make fun of my flip phone. Yeah, sure, that's fine. You're not going to cause yourself wounds that you carry for years and decades that hurt you and hurt people that are around you. Absolutely, come on. Some of you means you're going to have to put porn filters on your computer. And I know, oh, every guy in the room's going, oh, man, man, my computer's going to run slow now. Who cares? Come on. Who cares? Let it run slow. There are great applications out there. Covenant Eyes, uh, we use X3 Watch for forever. Um, uh, these, these sites that I love about it because they don't keep you from going to porn sites or to sites you shouldn't go to. Um, but it sends an email to someone letting them know where you've been. When I, when I was to set this up, I would make my wife the person who would send the email to. Talk about an attorney. <laughs> I can remember, listen, and, and what I need you to do when you find out who you're going to send it to, I need you to send that email to the person that you least want to find out that you're doing stuff you shouldn't be doing. Right? Here, here's a story about that. When I was at Hayden, we had uh, a young man that was dealing with pornography addiction. He had, um, he had inherited it from his dad. His dad had pornography addiction. It was still ongoing. And so it was hard. Like, he couldn't put a whole bunch of blockers on his computer at the house, the family computer, because his dad would get flagged for a whole bunch of stuff. And so he finally got a laptop when he got it to be about a freshman sophomore in high school. And we put the stuff. And he would send emails to our youth minister, to our student pastor. He'd get the emails, you know, saying. And every week, every week, we'd get this email on Wednesday with this list of sites that he'd been to. Like, every week, he was just... He was just, just failing miserably in, in, in his addiction. He was addicted. It was, it was, it was like a drug. He was addicted. And, uh, and so you come into the youth pastor's office and sit down and you're like, oh man, I did it again. I'm so sorry. I'm going to try harder next week. But, right? And what happened is over time, he didn't come to care if I or a student pastor knew. It, it wasn't a deterrent for him. And so the student pastor comes to me and he tells me, he's like, I don't know what we're going to do with this kid because it doesn't bother him anymore when he comes in. And I've got this list of sites that he went to. So um, <laughs> I had our youth minister print out the list. And I went down to the office one Wednesday and, and he was in there and we were talking and he same story. Oh man, I messed up again. I can't believe it. And in our church we had this, this older woman. Um, her name was Carlista. She's, she's still there. She's an amazing lady. Her husband was a pastor for many, many years, and then he had passed away, and, and uh, she, like, had forgotten more about the Bible than I've ever learned, and she's just one of those that's just so wise, and everybody respected her, and, um, and, uh, and so uh, I, I went down, and, and it's the same story from him again, and I went, okay, well, I've asked, I've asked our student pastor to print out uh, the list of sites that she went to, and he went, okay, and I said, and Ms. Carlista is over in the education wing. She's, she's meeting me. We have a meeting. She's going to be a part of it. We're going to do right now, uh, his name is John, well, his name was... I forget. Anyway, he said, uh, that's what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, to take this list and we're going to go over it and we're going to show it to Miss Carlista. And I want you to tell her what you've been doing. You've heard of Fifty Shades of Grey. He, he turned Fifty Shades of White. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was kind of interesting to watch. He's like, oh no, 
we can't show Miss Callista that. That would be terrible. And I was like, y'all make like it doesn't bother you that shows us. Well, let's go find Miss Callista. We'll show her this. Listen, she, she's a godly little. She'll understand. She'll pray for you. She may, she may give you a little lecture. But, you know, I mean, like, she's not going to, like, you know, beat you or anything. Like, it's okay. We're going to tell Miss Oh, no. You can't do it. Like, okay, well, here's the deal. From here on out, that's the rule. The email comes to us, but if there's anything on that list, next Wednesday, we're going to take this list, we're going to find Mr. Lista. You want to know, you may have found a better way of hiding it, but we didn't get any more bad emails. It was open. Right? That was it. Like, and, I, and he may have found a better way to hide it, but I'm saying that was the end of it right there. Find somebody that you'd be ashamed to know. Talk to them and go, hey, I, just need, I need you to be that accountability. I need you to be that individual. It is, some of you means that you're going to need to get rid of your, your cable. Some means that you're going to need to get rid of your internet. And I know, how can I live without the internet? How can I live without cable? I don't know, but you've got to figure it out. Otherwise, you're going to live with scars and wounds. Paul doesn't say that it's going to be easy. He says, run away. Throw it away. Get away. Do whatever it is you have to do. Flee from sexual immorality so that you can honor God with your body. You know what the hardest part may be? Some of you all, your application of this may mean you need to go and end a relationship. It may mean you need to move out. It may mean you've been living with somebody that's been sexual. You're dating somebody and it's gotten sexual. And you know it's bad and you know it's wrong and you just need to be over. It just needs to be over. Run from, flee from, sexual matter. Talk about hard. Whew, that's hard. The other thing that I want you to do is I want you to begin renewing your mind. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I need you to understand that takes time. Guys, we have like a Rolodex in our head of images that we've seen, videos that we've seen. Women, you, you, you understand that, that there are images, there are, there are things that are in your mind, right? Renewing your mind means that you need to be very careful and very watchful about the music you listen to and the shows you watch and the movies you, you see. And I'm not in any way trying to say you can't go watch movies or, or listen to music. I'm just saying that when you listen to music that objectifies women, it may make you objectify women. When you listen to music that objectifies women, it may think it's okay for you to be objectified. No, it's not. Right? It's not just movies. It's not just, just, just images on a screen, by the way. You need to watch what books you're reading, what magazines you're reading. I used to joke when the Twilight series came out because it's all about Bella and she's you know, it's Team Jacob and it's Team Edward and all this kind of stuff. It's about this young woman who's being you know, pursued by two different guys, one of whom is a vampire who is incessantly beautiful, his, who doesn't sleep and has unlimited resources and lives forever. Like, there's no guy aside from maybe, you know, that can live up to that. <laughs> but when you put that in your mind, you put that in your brain. Come on, come on, come on. That's what you expect. And then all of a sudden, and all of a sudden, my husband isn't good enough. My boyfriend isn't good enough. My wife isn't good enough. My girlfriend isn't good enough. You've got to renew your mind. And this is how you're going to do it. Talk, this is, this is maybe the hardest thing, but this is so life transforming if you can wrap your head around it. For some of you, it means you're going to have to take a year off. In fact, we're, we, didn't, we didn't come up with this. We stole it. But it's called the one year challenge. You pull out a calendar. And you go one year from today, you put a big X and you say, I'm not going to date until this day. One year. Because I know that I've created chemical chains in my brain. And I know that I've bought into some of these lies. And I know that it's going to take time for me to reprogram my brain. And so I'm just going to take a year off. And I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to take a year. I'm not going to date. Let me tell you who can benefit from this the most. People who are divorced. Go get a calendar and go one year from the day that divorce is filed for the big X. I'm not going to date until this time. Let me tell you why. I've seen this happen over and over and over and over again. People get out of a marriage that was bad. And because they feel the need to connect, because they feel the need for that dopamine release in their brain, because they feel the need because sex has been such a part of their life for so long, they jump right back into a relationship that's just as bad as the one they just got out of. I'm, I'm just telling you. And say it'd be easy. Reprogram your brain and take a year. No sexual marriage, no dating for one year. Paul didn't say it'd be easy. 
But he said to honor God with a body and to sleep, run away from sexual morality. And whether you're a believer here today or you're not, you know if you're honest. That it's more than just physical. It's more than just casual. It's deeper than that. It's more important than that. It's its own category. So that's why God gave us the boundaries. That's why he told us to keep it in the fire, in the fire pit. If you want a little phrase that you can latch on to, is this. God wants you to have amazing sex. I told you that at the beginning of the, of the message. But intimacy is gained through purity, not practice. Purity paves the way to intimacy. Purity paves the way to intimacy. In just a minute, I'm going to pray. I want us to just kind of spend some time in the silence and ask God, where is it in my marriage? Where is it in my dating life? Where is it where I'm falling short of what God has asked me? Where is it that I'm taking sex outside of the boundaries in what I'm viewing, what I'm listening to, what I'm experiencing? Where is it that I'm doing something and taking it where it ought not to go? But in the middle of that, if you feel the least twinge of guilt, if you tend to feel the least twinge of what do I do now, I've already messed up, then I want to invite you back next week because we're going to talk about how you go, how you move forward after you've been what you've been. Okay? But right now, I want you to bow your heads with me. Let's pray. And just in a moment of silence, I want you to ask God and talk to God and be real honest with yourself. Heavenly Father, you know how um, how much of a struggle it it can be sometimes. I mean, how much of a struggle it was for me to get up here and say some of these things. God, I've, I've been nervous and anxious about it, but but you, God, have given us truth. Science backs that up. Data backs it up. It's kind of funny how how your truth does that. <laughs> it rings true. God, thank you for the gift of sex. Forgive us for the perversion that we've made it. Forgive us for the images that we have downloaded into our brains, for the activities that we've engaged in, all of the uniting and ununiting, and coupling and decoupling, and hooking up. One night stands that we've endured. God, we know that it causes wounds. We've, we've borne those wounds. We've, we've experienced those wounds. And even so, God, in our society, it becomes so difficult to, to just believe the truth. And to dispel the lies. And that's what sin does. It distorts what was meant for good. You've given us this gift, and in so many ways we've misused. And so, Father, now I pray that you would help us to apply this one simple phrase, flee from sexual immorality, flee from sexual activity outside of the boundaries of marriage that you've given us. And you're not asking us to do that because you don't like us. You're not asking us to do that because you want to, to get rid of our fun, God. You're asking us to do that because you love us and you've given us something incredibly powerful and you don't want us to hurt ourselves enough. So God, I pray that you reveal to every heart here in this room exactly where it is that they need to be radical. I pray that you would tell them the apps they need to get rid of, the websites they need to block. I pray that you would tell them the things that they need to do in order to flee from that. I pray that you would put accountability around them so that they could, could move forward in their life without bearing any more scars from their decisions. God, we love you. 
And we thank you, but we need your help. Because to do this is going to be so countercultural and it's going to be so hard. So grant us the wisdom to see the things we need to do and the courage to do them, no matter what the cost may be. We love you. We trust you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As always, if you want to talk with somebody, pray with anybody. We'll be back here at the starting point where you guys have a good one.